My dad is a gamekeeper and uh, we moved around quite a lot as children. When I was about 10 or 11, we ended up in Norfolk. We didn't live in a village, we literally lived in between two fields. There was n absolutely nothing there. Like the scenery I really liked, but it was so boring. And I think that's why me and my brother took up instruments and why quite a lot of our friends play instruments, because there is just nothing else to do. Growing up in Norfolk and just out in the country, it was pretty dull, to be honest. There's not a lot, <laughs> not a lot going on at all. I mean, you can learn an instrument or go to the beach. There's nothing really exciting to do. Quite a few guys at like my age that lived on the same street, so we kind of all like banded together and we started skating and... Like now, I, I, I don't really like cities that much and I think it was because from living here, it just... Because it doesn't condition you for real life, really. It's like a little bubble where everything is so far away. It's just fields and sea and people that you become friends with because there's no one else around. Like kids don't get much chance to get out to see the world and the guys are really lucky to get recognised outside of Norfolk and be able to go out and play shows. I grew up in Heacham, which I, I literally lived about two minute walk from the beach which was pretty cool. I, I've known Lee since, since I can remember really. We all kind of grew up in the same place, you know, typical teenagers going out, getting drunk every night in the park. James lived around about a five minute drive from me in the middle of nowhere which is probably why he's so good at guitar, because he didn't actually get to go out that much. The first guitar I had was 100 quid for the, the guitar and an amp and a lead. Like, me and my brother shared it. I guess because it was such a poor guitar, as a guitar player, it makes you put a bit more work into it, because the guitar does nothing for you. Because we didn't have an amplifier for so long, I invented chords that rang out all the strings at the same time to compensate for a bad guitar. It makes you learn other things in other ways that when you translate that to a good guitar, it's just so much easier to play. I probably wouldn't be half as good musically as I am now if it wasn't for growing up with James, because when you're in that closer proximity to someone who's, well, as talented as he is, playing guitar and singing, you naturally pick up on that. I remember being in primary school, I was in year six, and I was playing drums on the table on my maths book with uh, pencils, and I got told off. You know when someone tells you not to do something, you kind of want to do it more. From a very young age, I knew that I wanted to play drums. He's been ten, 10 years old, roughly, and he started banging around with wooden spoons. And he kept saying, I do really badly need a drum kit, Mum. And we kept saying, no, you know, we want to make sure that you're going to be completely committed. When I was younger, in the kind of Pennell's household, everything it revolved around like the family business, which is like the, the pipe organ um, factory that my granddad started. I was just surrounded by like classical instruments all the time. So come the age of 12, I was like, I want to be in a rock band. I want to start playing guitar. A lot of his mates were learning to play guitar, 
And when he showed sort of like a real interest in it, we got him some lessons. At the time, like Blink-182 were like one of my favourite bands. So I was just like, I really want what Tom plays. And that was a black strap. I used to play drums at a school and I'd never really heard any, well, I had heard rock. My dad used to play it and I used to kind of ignore it. The first album he ever bought me was Nirvana. Um, never mind, and he just said, like, on Christmas Day, he said, listen to the drums on this, and from that moment on, I was like, that's incredible. I played that song for about a month solid, nothing else. I didn't really listen to the rest of the album, just that song. I said to Thomas, you know, I've never heard you play the drums, I don't even know if you're really very serious, because I think he was a bit disappointed that Christmas that he didn't get a drum kit. And he said, well, you listen, to, you listen to me play the drums, and I'll prove to you that I can play. And then he just smashed out um, Nirvana, it smells like team spirit, and he just smashed it out, and I stood there like this. Oh my God, he can actually play the drums. When we were growing up, he was into really heavy music, like Under Oath, it used to be our favorite band. When I was starting to learn, I basically just wanted to play every single Blink song ever. And by the time that was all exhausted, I guess that's about the same time I started like writing music in other bands. When I first met Chris, he kind of messed about in a couple of bands. The one that sort of stuck for the longest was this band called Something About Dave. <laughs> a couple of times Chris asked um, members of his little band that they had going at the time if they could practice in our garage. I used to listen to like Killswitch Engage, As I Lay Dying, uh, Metallica, so many different like genres of music like ska, punk, metal. So there were occasions when I had my GCSEs and uh, Lee would be listening to some crazy metal music at like one o'clock in the morning and I'd have an exam at like nine o'clock the next day. When I first started school, I used to play football quite a lot. Then once I met James and a few other people, we all sort of like started playing music in the music room and that's how we sort of all got into music. First time I ever met James was I went for a guitar lesson in Hunstan. He just got dropped off by his mum and there was just this little boy with long hair. It was me and this other lad, we had electric tuners and that, and James was just like, oh, can you tune by pipes? Because he'd been doing it by the pipe, you know, when you tune a guitar by pipes, like pitch pipes. And I just remember thinking, who's this guy? I remember meeting Ryan and I thought he was so arrogant because he was like this kid who had this new guitar and cool hat on. He could play all these cool, like, metal riffs that I couldn't. We hit it off from there, really. I've been friends with Lee since he was about two. We started hanging out a lot more at high school and stuff, obviously, because we were just into music and, and that. I remember people called him Kiwi. He's always had nicknames. He was a bit of a gimp, a bit goofy. He always has stupid colour hair as well. Every summer holiday, he dyes his hair like blue or green or something. Strange. Because me and James used to like play together at school, James invited me in to play music, and we all clicked. Prior to that, you know, it wasn't for real, but then he... Um... We got him his first bass and he loved it. And then he was sort of asked to hook up with uh, James and Ryan. It was me, my friend Ryan Penty and Lee, and I, I think we were called Stranded or something, or Shattered. We had this sticker that we stuck on our bass drum. We had one song, Stand Your Ground, that was a good one. And then the rest of them were either Metallica, Sex Pistols or Will and Chili Pepper covers. Quite eclectic. We played one gig in Kings Inn, that went down well. Our first ever gig was uh was at school. We played in front of about 800 people in our school assembly. I'll always remember the moment when it got to the start of Under the Bridge, it was our second song, and uh, Lee tried to make all the audience clap along. Nobody in that school hall wanted to listen to us, and, uh, and he was trying to get everyone involved, but they weren't having any of it. I went to my own high school out of the way. It wasn't in Norfolk, it was in a place called Spalding. And I did A-levels. I picked, I picked um, ridiculous subjects. I picked chemistry, biology, psychology. And I uh, failed everything. I, got, I think I got a U in everything, so I got politely asked to leave. When I first met Tom, he had curtains, very blonde hair. He was a bit of a geek. <laughs> I went to college to study music, where I met Ryan, who was in a band with James and Lee at the time called Stranglehold. God, Stranglehold was like heavy, heavy, heavy metal. It's just pure, like... Metal called Kill Switch Engage basically were our favourite band in the world. So we went out and played a few shows locally and that and I still remember the first time we ever got a show in Norwich. We thought we were the big time. It was awful. It was <laughs> I remember seeing him in Heesham Social Club and it was all screaming music and all that sort of thing. James was a little uh, <laughs> long haired 
shy, didn't talk to girls. He just was interested in his music, nothing, nothing more, nothing less. I think I've always been in a band with Lee because he was the only bass player in Norfolk at the time. He knows exactly what I want to do because we've played in bands forever and it's nice having someone who has been a friend for so long be in your band and also someone you can go, Lee, play this and he'll be able to play it straight away. We've always played together, we've always practised together. Every band that we seem to get in together, we've always on the same wavelength. That's it. That's two in time, do it out of time. When Death of Vanna first started, it was me on just vocals, Ryan Mellor on guitar, a guy called Sebastian Spitz on guitar, and Tom Ogden on drums. It obviously formed from the band Lee, Ryan and I were in before. We decided we want to play Fall Out Boy songs instead of Lamb of God songs, because we wanted to get women. That wasn't the main reason. Ryan was at college in Kings Lynn, and he, he said, oh, I've got this awesome drummer. I was like, OK, who is he? And then I met Tom, and he was just the strangest, lankiest, floppy-haired person I've ever met in my life. My first impression of James where he was like a long-haired hippie, and then he'd, he'd turn up like two weeks later with a black sort of comb-over, pink polo on, and uh, yeah, turn up looking like Skrillex. When um, I met Tom at college, he was just a good drummer. He was the first proper drummer I'd ever met in my life, like, and that was really refreshing. And I remember meeting him and just thinking, I want to be in a band with him. I remember James coming around for the first time, can you? Mm. He was about 16, and he was really skinny and sort of ever so shy, weren't he? Mm. We never intended anything to happen. We just basically got together in Ryan's bedroom, I remember. We folded up his bed against the wall so we could put guitar cabs in there, put the vocals into his hi-fi, and it came out with these two little crap speakers and somehow got a drum kit in there. It basically formed for no apparent reason other than boredom and the hope that we could probably play in a school or college assembly as some of the girls would fancy us. We started that band as a laugh. It was like Funeral for a Friend covers in the tray. I still remember the first band practice we ever had and uh, Tom and James had to share a bed and they never met each other before my mum and dad's had. <laughs> The first CD was called, I think it was called the Sweet Sunset EP. It was kind of like emo-y, fast. The stuff I was making and the stuff all my friends were making it was just absolutely terrible. And then they came in with this five track EP of absolute gold. And I don't think anyone realised how good like James's voice was and how good they could be. When Death of Honor first started, I thought, oh God, here he goes again playing some awful music. We got a first gig sort of about an hour away from our hometown. We were like, oh wow, we're playing outside of Kings Lynn. We kind of wanted to do that more, so we did a, a little tour of Norfolk. <laughs> Played like Thetford, Grey Arm again, Kings Lynn. It was just that, that feeling of just being able to get away from your hometown where one of you could drive and play to three people in Ipswich. Well, when we first started seeing each other, he obviously wasn't away like that much because he only played like the Black Swan at Spalding on like a Saturday night. I always envisaged it though that when you got in a band and you started touring, you'd go and jump straight in a bus and then you'd go and play to hundreds of people. And um, that didn't, that wasn't the case at all. Around the first, first like probably year, maybe two years of Death of Anna, we basically played in like community centres and anywhere we could do it. All I remember is then guys just touring mm, relentlessly, time. just tour after tour and just doing sort of shitty pubs and clubs and gigs, guys, toilet venues basically. What I went through with them touring around Norfolk in the early days, just trying to get, like, not even getting any money for shows or anything like that, sleeping in a van, I could not do that with anyone else. There was a place in Thetford called The Ark. It was like a pub with a back room and it was pretty miserable, if I'm honest, but Chris Pennells used to put us on there. I think I started Kings in college probably like eight or nine years ago now. And at that time, I started like my own promotion company in like the local area, and so we were putting on loads of gigs. He was always really good at organising because he wanted things to happen. And... I actually ended up putting on Death of Anna for like their first, they did like a tour, but it was like four shows. And I think Seb was driving them in like their people carrier. He was a massive fan of our band. I think he was the only fan possibly in the world 
of our band at the time. So we always used to put us on even though like nobody cared about us. They've really kind of brought out the worst in me because I was still trying to like run this promotions company and be really serious about it. But I, like at the shows I just couldn't help but falling into stupid, silly little antics with it. We just immediately became like really good friends. When Seb decided he didn't want to leave, which he didn't actually tell us about, he told he he mentioned it on stage. We were playing a gig in Snettersham and he went up to the microphone and said, oh yeah, this will be my last gig. Kind of Ryan and Tom like pretty much just straight out asked me at college one day, they're like, look, do you want to come and join the band? I was like, well, yeah. I don't think there was a process of like thinking of people to get, we just instantly thought we could get Chris to play guitar. He actually used to kind of be their biggest fan. <laughs> so when they asked him to join, he was really, really excited. We found ourselves like, getting billed on all these metal shows all up and down the country, and eventually it sort of changed our mind with what we wanted to do. So then I went on vocals and we just thought, oh, we'll just go and be a southern rock band. <laughs> oh, right. Hey guys, look at the What's up, where? The early days of touring, they weren't very good. It was a lot of false promises from promoters going, yeah, tonight's going to be great, sold out, free people. Um, it was a lot of tours that, whilst you were on the tour, half of them got cancelled. Yeah, we're down from Norfolk. Uh, it's our first time. They just didn't give a fuck. And that was the coolest part for me. Like, they were up for anything. So if we had to do a 14-hour drive from the furthest point south in the UK to the furthest north point of Scotland, they would just do it for 40 pounds and like a crate of beer and a packet of walkers and throw all the gear on and just go. Early days of touring basically revolved around me just hassling people on MySpace for shows. No one really knew who we were. First time we had any contact with Death of Anna was me and Chris Pennells booked a tour through MySpace. That was a cool thing, not a cool thing, that's what you did, you message other bands on MySpace, like, hey man, do you want to do a weekender? And they'd be like, yeah, well we do really good in Bromley, so we'll sort out a show there and you book us one in uh, Luton and we'll do a swap. It was fun, I wouldn't, I'd definitely, I, would, I think I'd do it again, but I'm glad we did it. I mean, I can remember in the very early days when they used to travel in the van and all the equipment would be in there, they'd sleep in the van and everything else, and he'd come home from a tour and he'd be ill for a week. We used to tour in a LDV, like, old postal van. There used to be like five or six of us sleeping in it. Pretty grim. We'd managed to borrow like 900 pounds off of Ryan's Nam to buy this thing. I mean, we did a couple of European tours in it, and that was pretty scary. I guess that's just what you do when when you're starting out. Well, I think they just loved it so much; they didn't really care. We toured with um, like Love and Atlantis and Young Guns, were the first bands we did proper tours with, and they were just absolute tragedies, really. One of the shows, there was actually two people there. I don't think they paid, I think we forced them to come in. They still put on a show, you know, it was always a good show, it was always a good laugh and and everyone was, wasn't scared to get stuck in. And... It was hard. I think they were just doing a one-off in Paris. We didn't sleep for about 72 hours. When you don't sleep you go crazy and it was just horrible. We managed to kit for about an hour maybe outside the venue. It was really good fun but it was hard work um, and after a year of doing it, it then, it, yeah, it became even more hard work because you realise it. You weren't making any money and you had to live off your, you were living off your parents really and we were lucky that we had parents that would sort of support us slightly. When I first started with them, none of the equipment worked. <laughs> the amount of times that we've had to borrow, beg, plead, steal from, from other people just to try and get something that worked for, for more than a couple of weeks. Where people think, oh, this band are doing well, they're probably earning loads of money. They have got no idea, they're sleeping on people's floors, like eating stuff they have to steal. with Lone Atlantis and collectively there were probably 35 people on the whole tour that came to see us. Out of possible 30 dates we played about six of them but we stayed on the road for the whole thing and just had a laugh anyway. And we played a show in Birmingham once where not one person paid to come through the door. It's kind of embarrassing when you put in all that effort and then no one appreciates it. You kind of think sometimes, what's the point? The worst feeling ever was when there was kids who thought they were coming out to see you and it was going to be a proper show and there was going to be loads of kids there and that who were really into you and there would be like five other people there. That's when I felt embarrassed. Every show was a bit bleak, but 
we enjoyed doing it. We got a few beers every night and a few sandwiches. Literally didn't care. No, we thought, right, okay, where's the nearest Tesco's car park? <laughs> yeah. Let's get as much Van booze parking. as possible. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really great way to kind of experience the touring lifestyle and, and just to kind of be doing it because you really enjoy it and you love it. I think that's how we've become such like a hard-working band because we were just determined to make the most out of not playing to anyone. It was a lot of that for basically three, pushing four years of just relentless heartbreak and just playing these songs that you care so much about and just nothing. There was definitely some jealousy. I knew that was exactly what I wanted to do. The one thing I couldn't understand was would be how he'd come off tour and just be like, oh, fuck, I hate touring, it's just so annoying. I think, you fucking bastard. It taught us a lot about being in a band and that. No one can ever say they, they got an easy ride, definitely. <laughs> I remember seeing him down in the pub in Leighton and that was, it was awful. <laughs> it was some tatty old pub, backstreet pub sort of thing. I wasn't too keen on the early stuff, so we sort of went along to the shows just to be supportive. I think the first time I ever saw him was in Peterborough the Park. Even though there was about five people there, the fact that my brother's playing music to people was pretty cool. It was always quite um, interesting seeing him play in places like, I think the now defunct Queen's Arms in King's Lynn which was always nice because if you walked, your feet would stick to the ground. I, I guess back then, I never really took it that seriously. It was a bit of fun, like I didn't care that much about the music, but it was, it was more just a fun way to travel around and spend time with your friends and I guess play music. It definitely did inspire me, or like instill something in me, a want to get to that sort of level, just so I could potentially be touring and, and mainly to write my own music. Fun, very fun, it was like a, diff a completely different sort of touring. You didn't have to worry about too much. Back in the day, it was, it was sort of an escape just to get out and try and see a bit of England. Being able to get away without sort of your parents driving you around was just amazing. I've almost learned how to live for myself without having to move out of my like, family home, just from surviving off ham and cheese sandwiches. We had these terrible, terrible demos of these three songs that we've written called Love by the Riverside, Oh How Would You Crap Me Up, and This Afternoon Was a Total Disaster. And we put them up on our MySpace, and this independent label called Wolf at Your Door Records approached us. First heard of the band back in the days of MySpace, when I was working at Wolf at Your Door. We checked out the band, thought they were really great, and invited them to play a show. They were so fantastic live that we offered them a deal. I think it was the first label that ever had paid us attention. We were all pretty excited that we finally had like a platform to then release first an EP and then an album. James was just an absolute natural talent, a fantastic songwriter with a great voice. The songs really stood out and we really wanted to see if the band could progress to the next level. They kind of saved us a little bit because we were struggling. We had no money. We had no sort of financial backing of any kind. We just judged them as people and were very happy by the fact that they showed interest and wanted to put money behind us. The thought of getting signed when we were younger, we jumped on the bandwagon, we was like, amazing, we're actually going to get signed. We'd never thought we'd have the opportunity to be able to say we're on a record label or, you know, get an advance. They were pretty much the only people that wanted to sign us. They were the only people who wanted to sign us. And we met them and we saw that they were nice people. We signed with them with no real questions, I think. Of course we were naive, but it's all a learning curve. Given the opportunities we got out of signing that record deal in the first place, we wouldn't have been afforded the opportunities to then sign to BMG. We felt a little bit of hope. There was someone's interest, someone apart from us in the industry is interested in what we're doing. I think we signed them in 2007. We had them record, uh, it's called The Easy Life EP. Uh, we put out that EP through uh, Wolf at Your Door. And then we had the songs ready to go, we went and recorded them, and that went really well. We didn't force that one out, that was just sort of came naturally. I think when we recorded it, we all we camped, all five of us, in one two-man tent, in a field that we paid seven pounds a day. We have to get drunk to sleep in them sort of situation. Yeah, so it wasn't easy, but we didn't know any different at the time, we just thought it was really good fun. That ended up getting a lot of critical acclaim, a lot of press, enabled them to do a lot more shows, enabled them to start being sort of noticed. We started playing slightly bigger shows, but we were still really 
just looking after ourselves at that point. I think we'd all kind of had enough of playing to three people and then we started playing to sort of 50. By the end of the easy life cycle we could pull a fairly decent amount of people in like really small venues, sort of 100 people in that Nags Head in High Wycombe. Hi, I'm Ryan from Death of Anna. We're going to go interview some of the people loitering in the area outside the underworld. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Are you young guns as well? Yeah. Young guns, I'm with you guys. They're rubbish. Before you spoke to any of them, do you remember looking at them and thinking they're all a bunch of wankers? Yeah, I yeah, do. Actually, I remember yeah. just thinking... They were, all, they were all in the corner eating, eating like, the pasta. Yeah. <laughs> you can't take it away from Ron. He was an incredible frontman. He always used to get the crowd really going. I, I like the passion that they had and the aggressiveness. They were, they were quite, um, quite buzzy, lots of people jumping about, lots of people moshing, going a bit crazy. They may have only been playing to about 50 people, but uh, it felt full and it was like a really good atmosphere. They were very good. It was screamo, emo, very energetic. It, it just had balls, not a lot of tracks that then had balls and playing live, they were incredible. When we first started working with Wolfie Door, there was a guy there called Leo who would run the day-to-day -day sort of side of things. He kind of managed us, he got us loads of press. But there wouldn't be a day that goes by without myself or Chris talking on the phone. I'd probably speak to Chris more than I'd speak to my girlfriend. We definitely formed a, a very close bond over the time that we spent together. Leo got us uh, all the introducing sections in magazines and kind of put our foot in the door. After all the EP stuff was done, we got asked to do an album. It was a bit of a rush, to be honest, um, to get that album done, because it was like, at the time when everyone else was doing their full length. Certainly in our like, peer group, it was like, about the same time that obviously like We Are The Ocean were putting out like, their first album, Young Guns were doing their first album, and the label were like, that you guys need to do a full length. We started work on that pretty much as soon as the EP had already been out. That was from scratch, like we, we didn't put any songs from the EP on, so we had to go and write a whole album from scratch fairly quickly. That was really hard. We didn't know what we were doing, basically. Like, myself and James, just sat in front of my computer and wrote it all. Well, the writing process back then would consist of me and Ryan in Ryan's bedroom with his computer, a Line 6 pod thing. We just made up a song, so basically we'd come up with an intro and a verse and a chorus and then just complete a song, and then we'd go to bed, and then the next morning we'd wake up and literally just throw some lyrics on there. From the, the shit demos we did to the ones on the album, the song structure, nothing changed. And it was just, it was just really sloppy, rushed songwriting. So that's why a lot of the lyrics don't even make any sense or anything because it was just rush. When we were getting pre-production demos from Ryan and James, they sent us friends like these through, which got everybody at Wolfie Door extremely excited. We eventually paired them up with Matt O'Grady, um, who had previously worked with Yumi at Six and Architects to actually record the record. We knew we didn't want to make like another kind of like heavy record like the EP was. We wanted to continue to like push it. Kind of pop rock with screaming on it, which sounds a bit of a, an odd combination. It was almost kind of awkward doing it still with a screamer in the band as well. We, yeah, we did kind of feel that we had to put the screaming on it because we we're not sort of dicks that would just go, sorry mate, we don't need you anymore. But what I've always said was I'm glad we did that album and it got out of the way because that type of music just had run, run out of legs, hadn't it? This, this song, Friends Like These. Self and Jane wrote that song, I say, just sitting in front of my computer. I think it was literally the second song we wrote for the album. We had this chorus, which basically sounded like a nursery rhyme. And as a joke, I said to Ryan, should we put this in a song? When we wrote that, it was just like, oh, that's really annoyingly catchy. It turned out to become friends like these. I remember Ryan and James telling me when they were writing that song, they were like, we just want to write a song that you can just, like, stick on in summer. We recorded that and we, we all agreed that that would be the first sort of single. We had this song and we thought, oh, we'll try and play it because it's got a catchy chorus. It'll at least, if no one remembers anything from the set, we'll at least almost teach the crowd that chorus. It did a lot for the band at the time. Like, when we recorded it properly, it was the first song that people started caring about. When Wolf released Friends Like These, the reaction to the music video was pretty phenomenal. The band and the label had never seen stats on a music video like that before. It was really cool, because no one from here had ever done that before. I was a bit astonished 
that it did as well as it did. I never expected to do anything like that, ever. Tour offers started coming in that hadn't come in before. More people in the industry were taking notice of the band. It was quite weird. We would actually go into clubs and actually hear the song. It made a massive impact on people coming to our shows and they would actually just come to see that song. It was a double-edged sword really because on one hand it was great that people knew a song that they knew the words to and could sing back at you, but also it was the only song that people cared about. <laughs> Everyone would just come and see us and just stand still throughout the whole gig and then you'd go and mental with friends like these at the end and it would just start getting really boring. I can never understand that switch between oh come on girl with a girl with a girl and then ah, this is my favourite song. Right, this next song we've just recently recently made a video for. We still hadn't written music that that I think we were all 100% happy with, and to have that song get as big as it did was kind of annoying. I think without that song we wouldn't have made that initial jump from playing basements to playing actual licensed venues. So that song I did do a lot for us at the time, but came back to haunt me personally because it's such a terrible song, isn't it? Reaches. Two words, four words. It's easy, easy yeah, to the, yeah, to the slightly <laughs> older life yeah, of marriage. Oh, it's yeah. that one. Gary Barlow. <laughs> I think it was October of 2009, I went to meet the guys at um, in the city in Manchester. I remember meeting them and, and at the time it was like, Chris really liked me and really wanted to work with me and he was always really infused. But I remember the rest of the guys were like, who the hell is this guy just turning up out of nowhere? Like, what does he know? Everyone was like talking about this Jamie Osmond guy and I, I could never remember ever meeting him. And this little blonde haired pudgy faced gimp turned up and I looked at him, I was obviously wasted. I was like, I'm not letting that man tell me what to do and manage us. About a month later, we kind of started officially working together. The best part of it for me was that we hit it off like best friends. For ages, until I properly met him, I was like, nah, I'm not, he's not managing us, he's an idiot. He doesn't know anything. But I guess I warmed to him and it turned out very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was poor. Dear brother, I have never asked this much of you. Could you please just take my hand and show them how much I can? First time I came across Death Havana, uh, I used to work for a website called Punktastic. We got James Lee to do an acoustic version of uh, Nicotine and Alcohol Save My Life. I remember not knowing a huge amount about the band before um, and then him sending this over and thinking it was great. And then we put it online and it had more hits than I think any video we'd ever put online before. first album we were all at Matt O'Grady's doing like tracking bits and we were all coming to and from the studio. We all went into the process being like let's stick together as five and then into day three I think it was Ryan had gone up to Scotland. I don't really look back on it like that sort of time too fondly because I think there was there was definitely parts of me that were thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And then there was other parts of me, the, the, the sort of 13-year-old me, sort of saying, well, of course you do. And this is all what you've always wanted to do, you've wanted to be in a band and all this. And I think that was about the time that we realised that that he wanted to spend a lot more time like with his family. In all the bands I've been in before, I've always like played guitar or I've played drums for bands and things. And being so uninvolved in the recording process was horrible. I hated that. And then literally I was just some dude that went and screamed on the top of these records and it was just, I didn't like that at all. We did a couple of tours where everything was fine and then we did a tour where Ryan would drive himself to the show. It had, it built this divide in, in the camp. So it was weird performing like that because we'd all have to come together on the stage and, and pretend everything was all right. It was hard for them all. He wouldn't do sound check. He'd turn up about half hour before they played, play the set and then leave. There's a lot of knowledge from our side that Ryan and the band were kind of uh, going their separate ways. I think as well it was starting to be the music and I could I could tell that at, one, at some points towards the end when I was in the band that it weren't really what we wanted to be doing. I'd heard the tracks I'd written with Ryan 
for the new stuff, to be honest, it was poor. Like, it was almost like they were writing that music just because they had to write that music. They, they had a guy who screamed, so they had to have a guy who screamed in the songs. We just eventually just grew, grew apart. Quite sad, in a way, but quite upsetting. One of our friends, and we could just literally just see him drifting away. A few more shots to be doing. And lots of funny jumping about, which yeah. is always fun to watch, especially the individual ones, when you've got Chris here jumping. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been in Bounds of Rise since I was, like, 13, 14. And they've always been so aligned, and then suddenly he just seemed really distant. And then it just sort of went downhill. And we were just like, we can't, we can't wait forever, do you know what I mean? You have to make a decision. I just got a text one day and it was like, I'm leaving the band, I've got bigger things to do. Uh, I'm not into it anymore. It just felt like at the right point, really, and I was happy. And then I sort of spoke to the guys about it and that, and they, they understood, I suppose. It was kind of a breath of fresh air at the same time as being sad because it had been building up for so long. If I'd have stayed in the band, we would have changed probably in that direction eventually anyway, definitely. No, it was obviously for the best, you know, I don't think they would have been able to get to the level they're at now, sounding the way they did. But Ryan was a really good lad, and then everyone, anyone that knew him would, would tell me that he's, he's a really good bloke. Now I'm totally happy with everything and, and how well everything's gone for them, especially. But I'm still surprised they managed to arrange a band practice up for less. It's God's not true, man. Tom James and Patty couldn't organise a piss up in a brothel, like, it's so funny. <laughs> Mr. Ryan Myself and James, we spent nearly every day together since I was about 13 until a couple of years ago or so when I, when I left. We spent every day together, more or less. That was the saddest thing for me. I didn't care that he wasn't in the band, but the fact that we lost that closeness and weren't hanging around with each other was really sad. Gave the news last night that Ryan's no longer in the band. So yeah, we thought we'd make a little video to just clarify a few things. A lot of you are upset about Ryan leaving. We are as well. We haven't kicked him out. Some of you are saying we have. We haven't. We are still very good friends with him. There's always kind of a backlash. And I remember when Ryan left, there was there was definitely that on the forums and things like that. It was a lot of people saying, bring Ryan back, you're never going to be as good without him. I mean, even still now, we get people saying, bring Ryan back. It, there was a valid point back then. It's not a valid point anymore, but it was a valid point back then because it had been such a long time coming. For us, it was old news. We already knew. But for them, it was such a shock. We probably knew for about eight to 12 weeks before we actually announced it, but we didn't know for a long time. The fan reaction, because we kept the name, has always been bring Ryan back, where's Ryan? It's just strange because I just sort of think, well, it was just a moment in time when it is. Just, I, I can imagine it must be frustrating for them because all they want to do is just carry on and move on. I think every band does that. When it's someone so key as a, as a vocalist, you kind of lose a key part of your sound and we did we did change a different band. Uh, basically, yeah, I'm going to be doing all the vocals, so it's not going to be the same, but hopefully you'll enjoy it still. Everyone likes a bit of screaming, but... Uh, um, we didn't want to replace Ryan, but yeah, all shows are going ahead. All shows are going ahead. Uh, <clears throat> with me doing vocals, if you want to come along and have a laugh. After Ryan left, I'm pretty sure I didn't really know where I wanted to go. Do we get in a new screamer and continue this kind of like punky, heavier direction we're going, or do I take over lead vocals and become more of a commercial band? None of us knew what we wanted to do, but we knew that we couldn't replace Ryan, and we knew that James had a good voice. I think although I thought, the band thought, that with James as a front man, we could definitely do a lot better commercially, it was hard for us to kind of get the label on board at that, at that time. I think it was worrying for, for us to think that one of uh, one of our primary bands had lost such an instrumental part of their setup. And when Ryan did leave, they actually got a temporary replacement. Because we had some tours booked, when Ryan left, I couldn't do all the vocals, so we got our friend Max Dalbiak to come and fill in for us. He was going to join the band. We had so much fun, but it was mainly because we were drunk and we were travelling around Europe with some great people. So we had a photo taken with him in the band. We basically asked him to join. And then when we got home, we sobered up and re-evaluated. From that point, it was kind of about like rebuilding the band as a four piece with James, you know, fronting it. I was all over the place. I had no idea where we wanted to go because I'd just been shoved into this position of being a singer. Ryan leaving forced James into a position he didn't necessarily want to be in, but at the same time, I think it definitely allowed him to grow. <laughs> I think it scared him to death. Like, I don't think he wanted it. James always had a microphone, so he knows how to talk to people. I think he was just trying to get used to the fact that people now listen to him. We already had written a song 
which we intended Ryan to scream on. It's called My Life is Average. I'd written all the lyrics, so I just recorded all the vocals to it. We recorded this song that we'd written in like a day, put it online and said, Ryan's left, here's what we'd like now. That, that, I think that was the first song that James wrote lyrics to, and I just remember hearing that and thinking, Hang on, not only are the words really good, but his voice, it sounded a lot more mature and, well, a lot more to my taste. I think the lyrics kind of made a lot more sense because they were literal and they, they meant exactly what James was saying. When James writes lyrics, he writes with so much feeling and he writes about, like, real life. What I like about James's style in particular, he barely uses metaphors and he always writes about real life experiences. We'd written this song and released it and put it on MySpace. And it was kind of divided camp. Some people loved it, some people hated it. Obviously, we got people that saying that we, that we wanted Ryan back and wanted Screaming back. A lot of people we like, like, like James' voice, so it was balancing in between the two, and we obviously preferred it without any screaming. We've been going through some crap at the moment, I'm sure you all know about it, and to know people still actually care <laughs> is great. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Thing with no wind, mate. <laughs> anyway. I started working with Death Havana when I was tour managing and doing front of house for a band called Emerosa. I think that Emerosa tour was the first tour that they'd done as a four piece with James being the front man. And obviously it was still very early in a transition of reworking the old music. Some stuff was still quite heavy. They were still in a position where they were still having to tour the existing record and adapt the songs. Well, I mean, when I first started with them, they were just like a, like a two-bit hardcore band. A Norfolk, every time I die kind of covers band, you know. With Ryan leaving and James being sort of forced into the front man position, it, it took a while. It took a couple of years of trying to recreate old, heavier songs with James just singing and trying to work out what they actually wanted to sound like. Because essentially we just started from scratch again. So it was still cool to see like, you know, like 100, 200 kids to come to shows. But I think the tours we started doing really helped develop what the band is now, live-wise and like musically. Between when Ryan left and Fools and Murphys Lives, we did a couple of tours with bands and just, I, we wrote sort of two or three songs. They weren't really, they didn't really know where they wanted to be. After that, it kind of hit this block around summertime and then James wrote Smiles All Round, and that, from the demo to the finished form, was the song I think we all kind of went, wow, this is amazing. So we went into start demoing Pools and Murphy's Liars. The first one we wrote was I Will Try, I think, with the, the woe chant at the start. Mainly, I was just all over the place. I didn't know where to go musically. So when we wrote I Will Try and Little White Lies, it just sounded more, ah, this is the sound. I don't know if anyone's going to like it, but this is what we're going to do. And then we really struggled, actually, because me and James kind of locked ourselves away in, in Regal House and literally just stayed there for months and tried to write this album and it wouldn't happen. It would take me months to write one song's worth of lyrics and it was a struggle and I, I, I remember thinking I don't think I can do it. I don't, I don't think I'll ever be able to write a whole album's worth of lyrics because I was in charge and I had to produce this thing which I didn't think I could. We love that. <laughs> when James moved to London, it obviously changed his outlook on, on life. You know, for me, Falls and Worthless Lies, the way that he wrote the lyrics on that record, you know, young and unemployable, lonely, drunk and beautiful, I think it was a real statement for a generation. A lot of people aren't in work and they don't know what they're doing or they finish university and they haven't got a job. And, you know, I think he really summed up where a lot of people's heads were at. I remember having a conversation with our manager. He said, like, what are we going to do for this next record? And we were like, we want to write, write catchy tunes with lyrics that everyone can relate to. So we knew we had to take it in a new direction and, and definitely get some more support behind it who could afford to take us to radio, give us a full-time press push and start to build it in other territories. 
And at this point, Leo had left Wolf at your door. They didn't have the money to do it and we had no money to, to make it. We didn't have that resource from the label, so it was definitely, we worked with what we had, but it was really tough. And then I actually kind of put in my entire life savings into making this album. Tom and James were down it every day, weren't they, for yeah. six months working on that album. We realised they had something going on and we're just we're obviously happy to help. When they were doing the demos for Fools and Worthless Liars, I used to pick them up after work. They used to, they used to tell me to put a CD. They recorded a, a different, um, a couple of new tracks, and we couldn't wait to get it on the CD player in the car and listen to it on the way home. We'd just get drunk, and he'd just write gibberish down, and in the morning, going, "Oh, it's pretty good." And then we'd record it the next day. And it was only when I stopped trying and really relaxed that the songs came out. It was like someone just pulled a plug and just went, everything came out. We'd just lock ourselves away for months, and then it all came to us in a week. So we kind of wrote most of the album in a week. It came out in the end and we had an album that we were happy with and we recorded it with Matt O'Grady again. It was the first time ever as a band we recorded something and listened to it back and thought, that's actually quite good. This could actually do something. You could see a change over, you know, over time to where James got more comfortable in writing and the band kind of just sat down and stopped writing music that they felt like they needed to write and they wrote music that they wanted to write. It certainly showed them evolving from how they'd been probably a year, 18 months before, in both writing and, and the musicianship, really. I think we're, we're all pretty happy with the way the songs came out on that record, because it, it just shows a bit more maturity from what Meet Me Halfway, at least, was. I need to set aside my ways And figure out all the things I have to change. It's Sophie for Culture Compass. I'm here at Slam Dunk uh, South with Death Havana. How are you all? Drunk as fuck. Well. Are you? I'm going to have to stop drinking from now until we play because I'm so pissed. <laughs> I can't even see. I don't even know. <laughs> I'm beard. I was reading just as long. <laughs> I can't even talk. Are you sober? I am, sadly. Unbelievable. I went after this. Oh, sorry. Oh. oh. This is the rest of it, have the rest of it. You finished it, can I have the rest of it? Don't fail. This is going to go down in history as the best interview ever. OK. I think the, the real turning point, for me anyway, was the first year we played Slam Dunk. We were on this stage called the Kerrang Introducing stage. The whole place was absolutely rammed. We could definitely see the change between when we had Ryan and, like, our new material. It was amazing. I think that was, like, the reward after, like, you know, like months of hard work, you get everything up to scratch again. That one show was just like, right, yeah, we're doing something right here. That was the moment that I kind of went, oh, okay, I've got something really special here to work with. So, how was your set last night? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah it was really good. So good. We were just singing. The reaction was very good. Yeah, it was. I think that's when we knew we made the right choice in not getting another screamer in. It was the first show where that many people watched us. For me personally, the relief that I had because I was so worried about writing and can I do it as a front man? That was just like, yes, you can. Hey, Vian and Thomas. That's shit. I'm trying to work out what these creatures do. My theory is, like, you play gigs, you have no money, and they give you free alcohol. What do they want you to do? <laughs> it's easy. You can do anything when you're drunk. You can fly. <laughs> to look after the guys, I'd heard lots of rumours before I started working with them that they weren't that easy. They were always out drinking quite a lot. They'd disappear. But Chris Pennells was a guy who kind of was like the most sensible one. On the drive back from Birmingham to, to Whiz Beach to drop the gear off at Tom's, Chris was the guy who was sick in the van and outside of the van and down the side of the van. Well, I knew of the band before I started working with them. Well, I just had kept an eye on them for a while, heard good things about them, and then saw them at Sonosphere Festival. It was an open, strong bass stage. And so I managed to just stand on a little camber on a hill and watch them. The show was amazing, and what can you say if you can't get in a tent? It's kind of a good thing. There were so many people there compared to what they'd been playing before, and it was that was kind of when I thought they'd taken it to the next level. Breaking that gap through from being a band that you know people talk about to, to a band that are, are really going to make it big. I've, I've mixed in the hundreds of shows with these guys, lost count over the years. But every single show, James has a, has a talent of making the hair on the back of my neck stand up. He's got an MSPX though. <laughs> what what they call? <laughs> Look at this. Right, that's good then. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Don't watch us later. Oh, by the time this goes out, people are. 
Never mind, never mind. <laughs> I think I first met a couple of the guys from BMG at our garage show in November 2010. We did a couple of like showcases for, for record labels. So I remember it was stressful because I thought that that was our future. In that performance, I was deciding whether we could carry on or not. They came to me with most of Fools and Worthless Lies demoed already, and the band also had a solid and hard-earned fan base that they'd grown themselves. Actually recording Fools, we still didn't know indefinitely that we would have been able to, to sign to BMG. That whole time, Jamie was just like fronting all of his own money. There was a time when I was like, wow, I've, I've, lost, I've lost all this money because there, there was honestly a period about three months before Falls came out, we didn't even know if the record was going to be released. It was a very kind of nerve-wracking period. I think from the demos to us actually putting pen to paper with BMG was like well over a year. And I was just blown away by the songwriting and uh, spotted that this was a band that deserved to be heard on a, a bigger stage and, and seen by a wider audience and I wanted to help and be part of that. Trying to BMG was a massive step up for us. You always want to better yourself. You always want to go one further than you've already been. But being offered a deal from a major label was just like, OK, we are doing something right. I mean, it came as no surprise to me to see them signing to a major label because just the songs had so much commercial potential. They offered us a contract where we got all the freedom, which is very rare to find in a major label. A lot of bands will get signed and then you know, you have to build the fan base and you, you have to write and record the album. Death of Anna, there was everything ready to go, and so it was a bit of a, an obvious decision. It just needed that push. Yeah, the fan reaction to Fools and Officers Liars was actually mind blowing. I remember the first time we got Fools sent over, and I remember sitting at the desk with Ben, our editor, playing it the first time, and just all of us sitting there going, this band are going to be huge. We were proud of it, but we thought the fans who liked us already were just going to hate it. The Fool's record was everything James he promised he would be able to do. I don't think we actually realised how big they were um, until the sort of the record came out. My granddad likes it, which is brilliant. He was driving somewhere and on our local radio station, it just randomly we were talking about Death of Anna and he thought, oh my gosh, where did all the screaming go? When they came back with the world or nothing, I just remember seeing Twitter exploding. And... They keep things interesting and they have really great fans who love pretty much anything that they do. So rather than doing the same old album over and over again, they always sort of challenge themselves to do something interesting and different. Yeah, it was just really humbling to think that everyone thought negative things and then we came out with this record and we put it out and no one had anything negative to say about it. gave the album like a big lead review, a big two-page review, which was kind of an honour to do because having seen where they've come from and what they've become and how solid an album it was, it was, you know, it was a real pleasure to actually be able to write and put down into words what, you know, what that kind of journey has meant for them. Bands seem to have backing track and add to the music with like strings. We thought we want real musicians to be able to play like you know real music. It's on the album, the Fools and Lies album. There's there's loads of layered guitars in the recording, so we thought let's bring it to the live. Before I first got asked to play with the band as a session musician, I am um, well, I was just in college. I was doing absolutely nothing. James basically said, "Look, we've got a headline tour in April. It's the biggest one we've done. We've basically written an album that has so many musical parts. We can't really cover it between four of us. Do you want to do it?" So, of course, I just thought, yeah, we'll drop everything. James' brother, Matt, has basically got the same voice as James anyway, and he's also, like, such a good guitarist. So to have him start playing with us was immediately better. I didn't think of it at the time, but because we'd grown up together, people kept commenting about how well, like, our voices blended. It just really worked out well. Yeah, when it finally happened, it worked out a lot better than I thought, because I was always worried if no one likes him, it's my fault. But luckily, it fitted in perfectly, and everyone, everyone just... Gelled. But Matt is exactly like his brother. You give him any instrument, 
and sit him in a room and he'll learn how to play it incredibly well in a very short period of time. His role in the band has just massively improved the sound. Playing my first gig with the band, I wasn't overawed by it because I knew that was what I wanted to do. I didn't necessarily get nervous. I thought, right, I've got to be good. As the year progressed, I started to really loosen up and actually get into it as a performance as opposed to just playing. We wanted to get a keyboard player for ages and ages, and we initially thought we'd get a, a girl, because a, a female backing vocal always sounds amazing as well. So what we wanted was a girl who could play piano and sing. Our friend's band, Venice, they weren't doing much live. So we asked Max to basically come and play a few shows with us and just see how it would go. I was at a uh, house party of uh, Def Vanna's manager, Jamie Osman. He was saying, we really can't find anyone to play piano for Death of Anna for the festival season. And I was just standing there, just like... When we got Matty in, I was worried that it wasn't going to work because we weren't going to gel, but that made us feel more together. And then when we got Max in, it added some more, even though hardly any of us really knew him that well. We got to know him so quickly and he just fitted in so much and he's equally as moronic and retarded as we are. It definitely suits the style I like playing. And now we're absolutely incredible boys and they're, you know, really close friends. It's been a, a good thing, I think, in, in terms of their progression in sound. We kind of thought bringing all these new elements would make us sound massive. The fan reaction over the 18 months of the album cycle was mad. We sold out the Electric Ballroom in London and we did Reading and Lee's main stage, which was absolutely insane. I can't explain how that feels. And then we sold out Shepherd's Bush Empire. The initial feeling was, if we go in this more commercial kind of way of just singing, will the fan base grow? And at first it was kind of like nothing happened, but then everything seemed to fall into place and the fan base just grew massively. It was a bit of a shock, really. It was like, oh shit, we actually have to be good now. For me, with the Falls and Muffers Lies, it was just the record that just kept growing and growing. It felt like it happened out of nowhere, because we've played so many shows like over the years that we've played to literally no one. When people start coming to your shows, it's quite daunting, it's quite weird. The one thing that I had always really wanted to do was play Reading main stage, because a couple of our friends had got it, and I was like, when the fuck are we going to get it? Reading was just ridiculous as an experience, because we were the first band on, we had no expectations. And I remember looking down and setting up the rest of my stuff, not paying any heed to the crowd at all, and I looked up and thought, Shit, that's all the way back to the sound desk. We, when we went to see them at Leeds, I was close to tears. Yeah, it was a bit of, it was quite moving. My first job with Death of Anna was at Redden and Leeds. It's really good, it's so scary because it was my first big show with the guys. When we got the opportunity to play Redden and Leeds, that was absolutely incredible. I had always been when I was younger. I was absolutely blown away. I, I think everyone was. But it was phenomenal to be able to do it. It was a milestone, definitely a tick. So the last headline tour we did on the Falls and Worthless Liars run, we really wanted to make sure that live, especially in London, that it was going to be quite special. It wasn't as big as like Running in Leeds and other stuff we've done, but it was really the, the most amazing experience ever. The shows had just been getting better and better anyway, and we thought because we played Norwich as a hometown that we'd reached like the peak of it. That was a very emotional evening actually. We were there as kids about five years ago watching someone who we completely idolised and now the kids that were there were doing the same to them. The Shepherds Bush Empire, when we got to play live with the uh, gospel choir, that was uh, incredible. I just remember being in Soundcheck, and as soon as we started playing these songs in Soundcheck with them, we were just completely blown away. It all just hit me when I walked on stage, it was ridiculous. That was just absolutely nuts. I think it was a defining moment for the boys too. It was pretty emotional backstage. I just stood the whole time, just like, what the hell is going on? How has this band that we've started gotten to playing like a sold out Shepherd's Bush Empire show? I nearly cried because I, I was just like, this is ridiculous. Ben Hammond, our sound engineer, said, well, at the time, that's probably the best show and the most proud um, show that he's been a part of. And I just remember back in the day, zero people paying in on the door and then fast forwarding with them to walking off of a tour bus at Shepherd's Bush Empire. These are the same morons that I grew up with. Now we're stood in a, uh, you know, in a, in a two and a half thousand capacity venue in London, sold out with thousands of kids, you know, singing all the words. That gig is just, it was the, it's the highlight of 
my musical career so far. I want to touch some wildlife. Yeah? Yeah. Not you. Not Ogden. I've touched these wildlife. I never thought I'd end up travelling the world with the band. i just done it to get out of Norfolk. I always dreamed of like touring the world, but I never thought I'd actually be able to do it. It's mad because people pay a lot of money to go on holiday to these countries, and we get flown there for free to play music that we've written in a studio in Wisbeach. And the countries are beautiful and incredible and so good to experience. You would never expect someone on the other side of the world to know who you are and like the music that you play. It's something that you can only dream of. I can't get my head around four guys from here, the arse end of nowhere, writing songs that people in Australia love. At least 100 people each night knew the words of our song. Like on Staten Pier, we played last every day. And that was the, seemed to be the song that people liked the most. And they were, they were singing songs back to me about a place that I grew up in being so, so far away from home, singing about your hometown. Sounds ridiculous, but there's no better feeling. It's I've never experienced anything like it. It was amazing. It's mental to think that the reach of the band can go that far. I uh, went to a barbecue with Metallica. Oh, meet yeah. anyone nice? James Hetfield. Oh, cool his nose and chuck. Yeah. Being able to go to Japan and to be greeted by fans out there and say they love these songs and see them singing along in their own country is really bizarre. When, when you can distance yourself and think about it, it just boggles the mind. I mean, to that point, the furthest away place I've been was Italy. I hadn't been on a plane since I was about six months old or something like that. The last show we played, this girl gave me a little bit of paper and it said, it said, thank you for coming to Japan. Your music speaks to my heart. Just can't get my head around it. And the nights get short. <laughs> The more time we spend playing music, I think the more bored we get with our current surroundings. So we're always looking to do something different to what we've done before. With loud rock, you can hide behind it and you can disguise it live, but we wanted to show people that we weren't doing that and we could actually play. When we recorded uh, the deluxe album, we actually went into the studio not having a clue what we were going to do. We just wanted to do something different, so we sort of went, let's just re-record the album with all these mental instruments that James buys off Amazon. Well, I always wanted to do something like that, just because the song started out on an acoustic guitar. Like, I wrote them in my house on an acoustic guitar. And then transferring to rock music, so it was so easy just to take it back down to just an acoustic and then building it again. We're always looking to evolve and almost challenge ourselves musically. So when we did the deluxe version, we were like, right, let's just put as much stuff that you would never hear on a rock record as possible. As you get older, you kind of, you do want to explore new avenues, so to speak. But from when I was 17, I couldn't see myself going, I'm going to do this album on cajon and mandolin. Lee, our producer, was really good at coming up with ideas with us when we were in there. The whole thing was a little bit of an experiment, really. They had a piece of A4 paper and it was like 1 to 13 written on it. You know, and some of the things were very, very vague. And some of the instructions, I mean, I think James had written something like, you know, you know one of the tracks, a bit like Bjork. Like the album doesn't really flow, but I think it's quite interesting to listen to because each song, we did a different kind of interesting recording technique or something, or just use different instruments. It was just really surreal. It was, even for, obviously, Lee recording it, there was, there was a lot of different ways it was recorded. I mean, we used the warehouse before, all things that we've never really done much before. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It was just, it was quite refreshing. We enjoy listening to acoustic music, so we thought we'd try and like give something to our fans to like branch out. 
we didn't think they'd like it that much, but it was quite surprising for people to turn around and be like, I really love this song. And we're like, well, okay, instead of thinking too much about how we want you know, the next record to sound, let's just continue at this kind of work rate and see what comes out naturally. And that's essentially what has came about in the next album. I remember sitting down after Frogs and Mushrooms Lives with James and being like, how on earth are we going to better this? So quite a while ago now, the guys started um, doing some demos for the new album here. When I recall was Boston Square, um, and even at the early stages, that song just sounded amazing. We kind of had access to this amazing studio, so James would just come and stay with my parents, and we'd both go down to the studio and just stay in there for, for hours. And we did a few of the demos for Old Souls there. Mainly him and Matty did a few of them on, on his iPad. Myself and James wrote the majority of the album together, um, just recording it on my laptop in pretty shoddy quality demos, but, um, you know, it, it did its job. In terms of what I wanted to sound like, I never really went for a sound. I just sort of sat back and let the songs come out. It didn't sound like it was necessarily a Death of Anastar. I didn't necessarily write it off. This sounds a lot more mature. The music is, in a way, simpler, but it's just much better songwriting. Instead of taking note of bands around us, we kind of went back to bands that we actually listened to, like Nirvana and Manx Street Preachers. We kind of went to that instead of music that's current. So we kind of wanted to create something that's timeless. We, and James especially, really just wanted to make a statement. He's setting out the platforms like, bam, here we are, this is what we're doing now. I felt a lot more able to put my actual influences into this album. I don't feel like I'm trying to be anything I'm not. I don't feel like I'm trying to impress anyone other than myself. I've never been more proud of anything in my life. because we had this incredible house, this mansion, um, and we, we all lived there and they had a studio in, downstairs. It was just really easy to go from being in a relaxed environment and then just going into the studio and having an input. The people there looking after us, Chris and Moyle, were incredible. If you wanted to get away, you could go in your room or go down to the park. There was so much space there. They've been a, they've been a laugh, it's been all right. It's been messy. Tim, it's quite such a quiet pub, and then you guys come in. We've got six bottle of lambs, maybe rub just for them. But. It was just a really relaxing atmosphere to be in, and it felt it felt like home. It felt like we could wake up whenever we wanted to, and record when we wanted to. We felt really comfortable. That is really good. Yeah. And we had uh, producers Lee and Youth working on it with us. Listening to the demos, the, the arrangements and the dynamics were pretty linear, so initially I thought some uh, arrangement and dynamics to make the songs really breathe and bring, and bring the songs up to another level. I really want to sort of showcase James's vocal on this one. Um, you know, he's grown a lot as a singer, so it was a case of really want you know bring that out as much as possible. You've done sort of the verve and crowded house. And it was just amazing having someone that's done all these amazing albums working on ours. We used to like writing our own songs and like doing it our own way, but it's good to have someone else's outlook on like how to write a song that sold like millions and millions of albums. He just has such a great way of doing that and just being non-invasive as well, just being there and adding to it. Cross between hungover and jet lag, the worst thing on earth. Ooh. 
gotta make sure your laces are right before you uh, record vocals, boy. <laughs> Try and truck a song. This is, I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> What's great about the band is they've had a lot of experience because they've been going a long time, but they're still quite young. And they all know each other really well. So there's a gang mentality of a bunch of mates on a, on a glorious adventure into the abyss, you know. And also creatively, just along with Lee, who they worked with before, who's a great engineer, find their true magnetic north. He gets a great sound and we had the, the mixture of Lee and youth working together, bounce off each other really well. It was like a massive influence on like all the songwriting and all of our performances when we were recording. He just thinks about songs in such a phenomenal way. Yeah, I think it really benefited the album so much. Whilst Tom was tracking the drums, me, James and Wilson would all be in there, like, playing along with him. And so, although he was playing it along to the click, there is a real live essence of a band that is actually playing here. The studio we're in isn't quite big enough for us to all play in the room. To get a, a little bit of performance and to work the arrangements out as a band, we had everyone playing in the control room where we are now. And then we kind of worked our way through the arrangements like that. James is one of those musicians that whatever he plays on whatever instrument, it comes out sounding genius. So we've had a lot of fun at the end just letting him jam through certain delay looping boxes and looping them, putting them backwards, sending them off into space and back again and creating a few three-dimensional sort of holographic layers that subtly underpin the main structure of the band. When we did Fools, we were under such a tight time constraint. This time around, we had the time to spend, you know, pretty much four or five days on each song. You know, this wasn't just a record that we, we brushed off really quickly. You know, the guys spent so much time perfecting it and adding so many layers that I think a lot of bands don't. James is obviously into his folk music and we'd kind of experimented with these other sounds and it worked. We were like, let's do it on a bigger scale. I think doing the deluxe album warmed around and it, it made them and us as a band view songs in a different way. So we've got string players, we've got choirs, we've got soul singer, uh, trumpet players, all these amazing musicians. Well, they saw me working with another band that I work for, and they asked me if I'd go and put down some vocals on a track on their new album, so yeah, it's good fun. And we also decided at that point to get Matty and Max in full time because there's piano and Hammond organ on every song and Matty plays acoustic guitar on every song. These main instruments were just a big part of the sound so we, we had to make it official. Certainly them being there the whole time, it just kind of made sense. They were playing on every song. They were part of every songwriting exercise, I guess, that we were going through. And it was just kind of like, why aren't they just in the band? We definitely all grew closer to each other and they were happy with what I was doing and they obviously wanted to make it permanent, which I was, you know, really happy about. I think Old Souls is most certainly the best material we've ever done as a band and it's certainly the best performance I've ever given on my instrument. Like 99% of the time you're in a band, you're on the road and that 1% is in the studio so it's almost like a record becomes like a timestamp of where the band is at the moment. For the first time everyone in the band really feels like we've created something that we're really proud of. When I did Falls on My First Light, I felt, right, this is the music I'm gonna play. And when we done this one, I felt even more comfortable, so hopefully it's just gonna keep getting more comfortable and keep growing. Even just the demos that James sent me, I knew it was probably the best stuff I've heard off anyone for a good while. 
album. It's original, it's refreshing, but it's timeless. It's really just seemed like they really stepped up. It makes you realise that they're really doing something a bit different and kind of, you know, really pushing themselves. I think we're all united in thinking this album is the best thing we've done and we're so proud of it. They're constantly evolving, like each album's slightly more mature than the last album and they're developing as people. Special moments for me personally was when we had a shoot in the garden, friends like these. Reading was a, a great thing, just, you know, making sure I got sort of like the front of that stage. I wanted to be there to see him. Absolutely every single tour we've done has just been stepping up and up and up. Standing on stage at Shepherd's Bush and just thinking back to where we'd come from, to where we'd ended up and just thinking, that's mental. Them kind of memories are amazing because the people we've managed to pull to those shows and the reaction from the crowd is incredible. But then again, back in the old days when we were just five lads not really know what we're doing going into this unknown was also amazing. We used to tour in an old red LDV and there was two rows of seats and then like an old futon mattress on the floor and we pulled it up and it was just about an inch thick of black mould. The entire inside of the van was just filled with mould and we'd been living in this for weeks on end. It's kind of like an initiation to touring. You've got to really go through it. It makes you appreciate each step a lot more. It's certainly important to me to stick with a lot of people that have helped you get to where you are today because they remember you from where you were playing to two kids a night. I've worked with so many different bands over the years and the term family is banded around so much. Havana it really is. I've never been on tour with a band who just love each other so much. They're so genuine, there's no front, like what you see is actually what exactly what you get. But they're kind of like us as well, I haven't really changed. I mean, as, as bands have got bigger and money changes people and stuff like that, not that any of us fuckers have got any money. But yeah, they're the same as they were. It was probably a bad thing, actually. <laughs> same as they were when I met them like five years ago. Yeah, arrogant, arrogant diva piece of oh, shit really, now. Really kind of always works. I was going to go the truth so part, but yeah, they're exactly the same. They haven't yeah. changed a bit. Watching the audience shift as well, you know, you've got a slightly maturing audience and then you've still got, you know, the kids are still loving it as well. We used to play and there used to be sort of 18 year old kids in the crowd and now when we play there's 23 year old, 24 year old. I kind of like to think that the music we make can appeal to everyone. It's incredible, but I don't think there's any as good songwriters as James in the UK at the moment. Quite a few songs on this album are about other people. And one in particular, there's one called Saved, which is about a friend of mine from so I met at college. I dropped out of college because I was touring and stuff, and he, we lost contact, and he fell into the, the Norfolk trap of like just getting with someone too young and, and having a child, and, and it just seemed like all his ambitions and aspirations were out the window. Uh, the song for me, to, to write a song about it, was just a release, really, and a way to get it out and not feel bad about it. I can personally relate to James' lyrics because we obviously lived in the same area, but I think a lot of people can relate to his lyrics because everything he says is honest. I always remember him saying that he was never truly content and happy with the music that he was writing in early years of death. I think it comes across now as everything that they're writing is more and more mature, um, more and more truthful than, uh, than it has been previously. I think James's lyrics have always been really easy to understand and sort of hold close to you just because they're so real, there's nothing, you know, sugar-coated. Now he's used to writing lyrics, he writes what he feels, he writes stories in my opinion, like I hear this stuff and I remember that happening and like him being like that. The lyrics, like with us being at school together, like I went through a lot of the things that like, he went through. Like on the new album, like some of the lyrics about our and Phil from school. While we were at school, no one really noticed that like, he was always he was, like, a lovely guy. And then all of a sudden, we've all left school, we started growing up, and then you hear like that one of your friends has taken his own life. Everything James Wright is a release. It's like a weight of his shoulders, I think. He wrote that song because he didn't want Phil to be forgotten. Like, and a lot of people around here will listen to that and not forget about him because of that. All the things he goes on about and in the songs and stuff like that, I obviously wrote it because I was there, you know. An important part of what influences us as a whole is just, is the whole experience of being a band. As opposed to before, James was just writing about life experiences in his past. James is now writing about just 
where he is right now. It may be specific, but at the same time, you know, you can really relate to it. It's got to come from, I don't know, some, I don't know, he's, he's, he's an old soul or something. James, he's never been the kind of front man who thrives off of the attention. He's quite an introvert when it comes down to it, which I think is to his benefit because it keeps him grounded and he doesn't get caught up in the whole sort of fame aspect of things. And I think that itself is what kind of separates them from other bands around them. With this album, it's another progression. Uh, it will only help them make those steps forward onto the next album and, you know, the touring's getting bigger, they're only growing. Wembley Stadium. Wembley. Hopefully. Mental. We just wish them every success and they deserve it, you know, they've put in Definitely. a lot of work and any band that comes in here and talks to us and says, you know, what are the guys like and all this stuff, you know, yeah. we're just honest with them and say, you know, they're great guys, they deserve every success they've got, they've worked so hard yeah. over the six, seven years they've been going and there's no one that deserves it more than those guys. Totally. It's not enough, no, 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 no. quite lucky in respect that I get to do this as my job and it's not something that I've wanted to do for the past year, it's something I've wanted to do since the age of six. It's much more than a hobby for me now, it's like a career and I'd certainly like it to last. I certainly didn't think that when I was skating around Munford at the age of 13, just learning to play guitar, that that hobby would take me to Japan and Australia hopefully the rest of the world. It started off as something we did for fun and now it really is pretty much my livelihood. It's turned into more than I ever thought it would. I definitely think as we're getting older and probably a bit more wiser, we're beginning to realise that instead of this just being something we really enjoy, it's something that we could probably end up doing for the rest of our lives. And I certainly wouldn't have done it any other way, I don't think. For me, it's just everything sort of I've ever wanted to do, playing live, recording. I was so lucky to have been able to do it. For me, it just means this is my chance. I've got to make the most of it. I'm thankful for it, but I'm, I don't take it for granted because there was a lot of hard work behind it. It, was, it didn't just happen, we, we earned it, I think. People who only just started getting into the band now won't know everything that they've been through and had to work through. It couldn't happen to, to better people how hard they've worked, they do deserve it. It means everything to me now, it's, it's my... It sounds cheesy, but it is my life, really. It's just kind of a part of who they are now, and I think they definitely deserve what's coming to them. Because the guys are my best friends, I want to be sat around a table with them in 20 years' time, being like, wow, we had a really good time. It's really weird for me, because loads of people go, oh, yeah, that's Death of Anna. Oh, they're my favourite band. And to me, it's like, my brother, I've grown up with him, he's nothing special. To us, they're just, they're just the boys. And they're really, really nice boys, aren't they? I definitely think there's something about coming home to Norfolk. It's not really like anywhere else in the country or in the world. I know it's kind of, there's not a lot here, but to me and to the other guys, it's kind of a special place. We grew up here. We, not only does the album reflect it, but we, we shot videos here, like Hunstanton Pier. We shot it in Hunstanton to show where we're from. Hunstanton Pier is obviously about where we grew up and where we went to school. A lot of people grow up, move to different cities, go to uni and forget about where they're from. I think that song stays with people because it reminds them where they're from, because it reminds me where I'm from. It reminds me where I grew up and it reminds me of all the good times I had. There's kind of elements of where we grew up in everything we've ever done. But I never want to detach myself. I never want to be that guy who's too big to ever come home.